Hey everybody, welcome to the Gray Zone. It's Max Blumenthal. We're live. We're about to go live on Rockfin whenever their streaming technology allows me to do so. Uh, thanks for waiting and being with us for another of our regular Friday live streams. And we are live at Rockfin. These live streams are so important to us. It's so important for us to do this and to engage with you every Friday that we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants and pulling things together. I actually was just working on two edits. One is up at thegrayzone.com, and we're going to discuss that. It's by Alex Rubenstein, and I was working with Aaron on what is going to be a blockbuster takedown of the OPCW's latest phony report on Duma, trying to justify all their previous attributions of that deception. Um, I guess with that, let me welcome my longtime colleague and loyal soldier at the gray zone, Aaron Mate of Canada, the future uh, 51st state of the U S Aaron, welcome. What's up, Max? Good to be here. Good to see you. Good to see yeah. everybody. Thanks. Wendy sheets for always supporting us. Uh, I always see these super stickers from her. So uh, yeah, sh uh, hit the like button, help us cheat the algorithm. And um what else can people do? Uh, yeah, give us a like and share this on social media if you want other people to join in to this live stream. Uh, this is how we do it. We don't advertise. We don't have too many media colleagues uh, promoting us because uh, because uh, we do something different. And so, yeah, so just give us a hand if you can and, and, and share our work and uh, promote us. We need a Gray Zone Army. Yeah, the Gray Zone Army. That's what... <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like I've heard that before. That's yeah, like some, no, we, I'm kidding. We, that's we like some alt right that. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, we are planning on talking about more climbing of the escalatory ladder in Ukraine, but I feel like we have to engage with the latest Cold War hysteria because this is actually, you know, setting the stage for the next war. If you can believe it, Ukraine is just kind of the trial balloon. <laughs> so to speak for the next war so just if you look on twitter one of the top trends is the chinese balloon and i had a really good uh card for this episode by the way at the last second i was able to get wyatt reed to photoshop it for me so you'll see it at the youtube um at the YouTube link, but it's uh, the little red balloon that 1956, I think French film with Tony Blinken's face photoshopped. And then you have some American Yahoo with a gun because that's kind of the dynamic at play here. But let's first hear from uh, the U S on this supposed Chinese surveillance balloon, which is now over Billings, Montana, or was yesterday over Billings, Montana, and is heading eastward towards the Midwestern United States and is sparking new cold war hysteria that is playing out at the highest levels at a very precipitous time. So um, this is the Pentagon as they were pushed to respond to this. Position of the balloon classified? Uh, Phil, right now, uh, what we're not gonna do is get into a hour by hour location of the balloon. Again, we're monitoring it closely. Uh, I, as I mentioned right now, it's over the center of the continental United States. That's about as specific as I'm going to get. But I understand it might be inconvenient, but does the public not have a right to know? Uh, the, the public certainly the has the ability to look up in the sky and, and see where the balloon is. <laughs> the balloon class. So they can just, the, that's the Pentagon. The public has the ability to look up in the sky and see where the balloon is. It sounds like, uh, a, it's a, it, I'm just reminded of like drug talk. Like you're, you're on drugs and you're looking up the sky, you see a balloon and you know, look at the balloon. Um, but yeah, no, uh, and this could spark a new kind of hands across America. You know, everyone goes outside and holds hands and looks up at the balloon and shows the Chinese that their balloons are not welcome. Yeah, it's it's well, it's it's kind of like an a, an alien film. <laughs> Every, they're here, they're coming. The Chinese are here. Yeah. It's also like a complete red scare propaganda. Um, whatever the case is, now the Chinese. Foreign Ministry is claiming that the balloon was actually a civilian aircraft that got 
led astray that kind of uh, there was a force majeure winds blew it east. It kind of, it wasn't supposed to be over the United States, especially at this time, the U S is the Pentagon is basically saying, this is a surveillance balloon. The whole point of these surveillance balloons is they cruise at like 80,000 feet. Unlike a satellite, they're able to provide much more detailed imagery. They're in the atmosphere. There's, there are less visual obstacles for them to photograph, for example, sensitive U.S. military infrastructure. And we know that in areas like Nevada or Montana, there are nuclear launching sites. So it might be something that China might want to take a look at. But the reality also is that we'll, we'll get more constant. We'll get into more context here. But the reality is that this not this would not be the first Chinese surveillance balloon to have flown over the United States. It just happens to be the first one that people can go out and take a look up at the sky and see themselves. So it's caused total hysteria. Uh, this is from one of the biggest gun fanatics and China hawks in Congress, MTG herself. She's been basically like every two seconds, she's been tweeting a call for some Yosemite Sam style shoot down of the balloon. And she's quote tweeting Ryan Zinke, who is Trump's secretary of the interior. Who's from Montana. Shoot it down. Ryan Zinke saying the Chinese spy balloon is clear provocation in Montana. We do not bow. We shoot it down. Take the shot. We do not bow. <laughs> you know, I heard Marjorie Taylor Greene interviewed by Glenn Greenwald the other day. And when she got to Ukraine, she sounded so sensible. Yeah. Right. Sensible. Um, I didn't agree, did really. Dis I don't remember disagreeing with one thing she said about Ukraine. But then, of course, when China comes up, it's a whole different story. And then this comes out, you know. And by the way, when is this news happening? It's coming one day or it, came, it broke on the day that the U.S. announced that it's massively expanding its military presence in the Philippines yep. in order to confront China. So literally on a day when the U.S. is saying we're expanding our military footprint. Uh, in the Philippines to take on China, there is a massive freakout in the U.S. over a balloon, over one balloon. Well, this the, the the expansion to the Philippines is also coming at a time when, as I discussed with scholar ask, activist Joseph Essertier in an interview you can watch at our YouTube channel, Japan is planning to double its military budget mm. with encouragement from the United States and is placing missile systems pointed at China on island chains that are surrounding Japan. So it's not just the Philippines. It's a full-on expansion of U.S. plans to provoke China. And, and what, what else is happening right now? Well, back in uh, November, there was the G20 summit in Bali, and it was there that... Uh, China's Xi met with President Joe Biden, and they basically agreed to kind of turn down the temperature. U.S.-Chinese relations were at a post-Cold War low. Uh, China was escalating its rhetoric in ways we hadn't heard because of the U.S.'s constant provocations, denunciations, the U.S. jailing this uh, one of the executives of Huawei, a Chinese firm, basically getting China to, I mean, Canada to detain her. Um, I mean, just constant provocation. And so Biden basically is now being pushed by pressure from his right, from Marjorie Taylor Greene, from, but also from his National Security Council. I mean, his own cabinet, he's surrounded by China hawks, Jake Sullivan, for example, Tony Blinken, for example, is a huge China hawk. And so what was going to take place was Tony Blinken was going to meet with his counterpart in the Chinese foreign ministry to make good on this promise to turn down the temperature to restore relations. And now Blinken has canceled his trip because he's bowing to public pressure from people like Ryan Zinke in Montana. He's bowing to the populist rights, anti-China hysteria about this balloon and diplomacy is effectively suspended for now. Yeah, well, we have the clip here of uh, Lloyd Austin. I can uh, share it if we, we want to play it. Yeah, I got it. You got it, okay. And, and so, yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin, former Raytheon board member, 
is ch discussing uh, plans to expand the U.S. military presence in the Philippines. Our alliance makes both of our democracies more secure and helps uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. And today we discuss ways to make this vital, vital alliance even stronger. We talked about enhancing our mutual defense posture and strengthening our commitments under our mutual defense treaty. We discussed concrete actions to address destabilizing activities in the waters surrounding the Philippines, including the West Philippine Sea. And we remain committed to strengthening our mutual capacities to resist armed attack. The important as the People's Republic of China continues to advance its illegitimate claims in the West Philippine Sea. Yeah, so Aaron, your reaction? Well, I mean, uh, does China have a military alliance and military bases in Venezuela or Nicaragua or uh, Cuba? No. Uh, how many bases does China even have outside of China? I think the answer is like, I don't know, one or maybe two. Um, at the most, it's, it's pretty small, whatever it is. And so it's just uh, with every country where that's an official enemy, there's always something that can be used to sow panic. Remember, you know, Iran, when, when Iranian ships counter American ships in their own waters, Iran is accused of aggressive behavior or when right. Iran shoots down an American drone spying on their territory that triggers calls for military strikes. And, you know, according to uh, multiple accounts, Trump back backed off at the last second of a military of a military strike against Iran, angering people like John Bolton after Iran shot down a U.S. drone. So in retaliation for Iran shooting down a U.S. drone, people like John Bolton wanted to kill people inside Iran. And, um, it's never discussed. Well, like, are are our mutual postures comparable? Is there parity between uh, what China is doing and what the U.S. is doing? And it's not even close. The U.S. is surrounding China with military infrastructure uh, everywhere. Uh, look at all the sh U.S. ships that are in those waters and bases around there. It's it's not even a comparison. Yeah. Well, uh, apparently the U.S. borders extend to the nine dash line, and we need to also. <laughs> As Marjorie Taylor Greene suggested, Trump would have built a giant sky wall, so this never would have happened. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta build the wall. We gotta build this the wall, and we gotta build the dome. <laughs> we'll, we'll put like a translucent dome so we can get some sun, though, because <laughs> uh, she likes to like. Um, she, she apparently likes to tan. Yeah, I like that comment. So, um, war. Who wants war? Well, the new chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee wants seems to want war with China. He seems to be really gung ho for war. So do figures in the Pentagon brass. So we had General Mike Minahan actually predict war with China by 2025, echoing Marine General James Bierman, mm -hmm. who said that Ukraine was basically a dress rehearsal for a war with China over the Taiwan Strait. And now here is the top House Foreign Affairs Republican agreeing with the possibility of war with China. I hope he's wrong as well. Referring to General Minahan said, Michael McCall, Republican of Texas. But I think he's right, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, and Minahan, by the way, is an Air Force general. The Air Force is going would play a decide, like an important leading role in any conflict over the Strait of Taiwan. And there were even plans back in 1958 for the Air Force to drop nuclear weapons on Chinese cities over that crisis mm. in the Taiwan Strait, as Gareth Porter reported for us. So, Max, uh, isn't uh, isn't Michael McCall the lawmaker who called the gray zone deeply disturbing? Yeah, Michael McCall has denounced the gray zone. <laughs> He's basically called on by um, I forget what that lady's name is, but she was like the the hack that. Um, Coda story or whatever it was. Yeah, Coda story. No, it was. It wasn't. It was. It was. I think it was the Axios. Oh, Axios. Basically, okay. we were shredding the whole Uyghur genocide narrative that was part of the Pompeo and Matthew Pottinger, who was a former Wall Street Journal reporter who got into the Trump NSC and was leading the whole uh, anti-China effort there. 
we were shredding that story. And then all of a sudden these reports appeared about us at mainstream publications or CODA story, which is sponsored by all these state department proxies. And they were portraying us as this fringe publication, which somehow was so influential that we were the most evil genocide deniers on the planet. It was really because we destroyed the reputation and credibility of the main researcher who was being relied upon for all of these phony data points and statistics about the Uyghur genocide and forced sterilizations in the Xinjiang province. It was Adrian Zentz. And so Pottinger, who was obviously weaponizing Zentz and instrumentalizing him, had to go after us. And they called on Michael McCall. He obviously got a call and he delivered some kind of throwaway comment that we are deeply disturbing or what we are doing is deeply disturbing. So, you know, it's proud to have been denounced. We're proud to have been denounced by the top China hawk in Congress. Obviously, this isn't limited to the Republicans, but we're now learning that it, uh, Kevin McCarthy, the new Republican speaker, is going to follow in the footsteps of Nancy Pelosi and take a, another provocative trip to Taiwan. Uh, really? Wow. You know, speaking wow. of, of balloons, okay, let's say you got a, you've got a balloon. I mean, imagine if there was some kind of disputed U.S. state and a Chinese that, you know, a, the, a, a, a a leader of the CPC in China took a trip there to express support for their separatist elements. I mean, yeah. By the way, I love, I love how uh, the Republicans have Michael McCall as one of their top hawks, and then the Democrats have Michael McFall as one of their top, yeah. top hawks. <laughs> so, much, so much flavor. They're sort of indistinguishable, except uh, McFall seems to be more flamboyantly idiotic. <laughs> Um, he, I could, we could, we could talk about yeah. him forever, yeah. but, but the point is we're, we're looking at terrifying levels of escalation in Ukraine, which we can talk about in a second, Yeah. but the real goal, and they've already placed a date on it. It's like when they say, uh, by 2030, we'll be carbon free by 2025, the air force general, Mike Minahan wants to be at war with China. And this is not, you know, your grandfather's China. This is China with advanced AI capability. This is China with a world-class blue water Navy. This is China with world-class anti-aircraft systems. This is China with a population that would be more supportive of a defensive military effort against a United States intervention over the Taiwan Strait than I think enlisted soldiers would be in the U.S. military, I actually talked to a former Marine who used to uh, live in the neighborhood of James Bierman. He saw my tweet about Bierman's comments about the ultimate need to go to war with China and Ukraine being a dress rehearsal. And he said, you know, my Marines, we, my guys, we fought in Iraq. We saw what war really was. None of us want to fight China. This guy is a psychopath. Uh, so that's, that's how like rank and file Marines feel. This was a former uh, officer, by the way. So I don't think this is going to end in a good place for anyone except maybe uh, uh, Lloyd Austin's former bosses and future employers, most likely in the arms industry. Yeah, Lloyd Austin sure is doing well for his uh, Raytheon colleagues. And of course, he was on the board there. And uh, what a boon for them. He's been uh, not just in Ukraine, but now in, in China. And, you know, speaking of spying, because Mike Pompeo is getting in on the act, he's planning a run for president. He's going to be like this faux America first neocon who uh, will put Saudi Arabia first, as we can see from his book, as well as Israel. And Anya Parampil, our colleague at the Gray Zone, my very close colleague, made a pretty good point about spying. You know, she wrote. Okay, here's Pompeo. When we realized the CCP was spying on Americans from their consulate in Houston, we shut it down. The Biden administration's weakness is provocative. Xi Jinping and the CCP are growing bolder because of it. Shoot down the CCP's balloon safely. It's got to be a safe shoot down. You know how the safe there's they can they can use safe shoot down weapons or unsafe shoot down weapons. And Pompeo prefers the safe one uh, and demand answers from Xi after we shoot it down. Cause you know, that's how you can just treat a powerful nuclear powers to demand answers after you attack its military. Is this the kind of spying Mike Pompeo prefers Anya asked? And she reminds us that Israel placed mysterious spy devices near the white house. This is Politico reporting it. 
uh, not exactly a bastion of anti-Zionist sentiment. Colloquially, colloquially known as stingrays, these spy devices mimic regular cell towers to fool cell phones into giving them their locations and identity information. The devices were likely intended to spy on President Donald Trump, one of the former officials said, as well as his top aides and closest associates, though it's not clear whether the Israeli efforts were successful. So under Mike Pompeo's watch, while he was CIA director, the Israeli government was spying on his boss, President Donald Trump. I guess like Kushner is probably like getting a direct line. Like, what do you hear about my father-in-law? But Pompeo, he didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. What he proceeded to do was just collaborate with Israel to wrangle Trump into agreeing to assassinate Qasem Soleimani, the second most important political figure in Iran, and almost bring the U.S. to the brink of war with Iran. But that's America first for you. Pompeo's yeah. going to say he's America first. America first, except when Israel spies on the president. Israel literally spied on the president, and it was like, does anyone even remember that story? No. And Trump, and what did Trump do? He moved, he granted Israel one of its big wishes, and he moved the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. You know, he... Yes. Uh, he uh, that's what he did in response to being spied on. That's how that's how we reward that's how we retaliate against Israel for spying on the president. Is, uh, well, like Obama, like Netanyahu literally came to Washington to denounce Obama and accuse him of uh, 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 lighting the flames of the next Holocaust by doing the Iran deal. He accepted an invitation from Barack Obama's top opponent, John Boehner, the Republican House leader. How did Re Obama respond? In the last UN vote, the U.S. abstained on a vote on Israel's settlement activity. Like, right. wow. and, that was, and that was billed as being somehow brave of Obama. Like He stood up to Israel because for, the, for once he didn't veto a resolution condemning Israeli settlements. And that was supposedly Obama, Obama's big rebuke is that he abstained. He let it yeah. pass. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and let's talk a little bit more about surveillance balloons um, because uh, China, it, it is almost like China just invented this, like this is some Chinese space weapon as if they're the only country that has ever done this. And as we've said, China has had spy balloons or alleged surveillance balloons come through U.S. skies before with no incident. But here's... Politico, again, U.S. military's newest weapon against China and Russia, hot air. Huh. The, U the Pentagon is quietly transitioning high-altitude balloon projects to the military services. So this is uh, part of the so-called great power competition. They fly between 60,000 and 90,000 feet, and they'll be added to the Pentagon's extensive surveillance network and could eventually be used to track hypersonic weapons. The Pentagon has spent about 3.8 million on these balloons and plans to spend over 27 million more in 2023 to continue work on these kinds of efforts. So you can assume that there are balloons in Chinese skies right now. And that seems to be some context that's left out. Uh, and China is surrounded by US bases. China is surrounded we have Okinawa right there. That is a U.S. military base, which is occupying a Japanese island against the wishes of its residents. That's right in China's backyard. Just imagine if China had a major military base right in our backyard while its leadership was predicting war with us within two years. Two years. So uh, this balloon, I mean... Is it like the shooting of Archduke Ferdinand? Is it just some trivial incident that could lead to an insane world war where the plebeians from Scranton to Spokane have to fight the king's war? That's what it increasingly feels like. And if you're, if you're like some uh, you know pop populist MAGA type and you've been questioning the war on Ukraine, you've been criticizing it and you're falling from this, for this, you're just getting played. You're just getting played. This isn't about defending sovereignty you know a few days ago before all this broke out uh jimmy Dore was on tucker carlson's show and that's a yeah. show that, that often pushes a hawkish line on china and jimmy said you know russia is not your enemy but but neither is china and i hope uh, that audience heard that because uh that's the message that, that needs to get out right now as you know it's like you have democrats they're prioritizing russia and china as uh as the official enemies whereas Whereas Republicans want to focus more on China, a little bit less on, but, but then of course, actually it depends who, because 
Michael McCall is equally on board with the Biden administration and confronting Russia too. It's just a it's a complete bipartisan consensus when it comes to to war. It's just a little bit at the margins. There's some dissent on the Republican side over Russia. Yeah, and didn't uh, some military figure accuse Tucker of Marxist Leninist propaganda for hosting Jimmy? Yeah, this Na- this former NATO official who uh, trolls me a lot. I'm sure he trolls you a lot too, Max. He he just accused Tucker of spreading Marxist Leninist propaganda because he had on Jimmy. <laughs> he's the guy. He's the guy who said that I was in da- that I'm a danger to Europe somehow. Uh, oh yeah, and that uh, somehow, um, yeah, you. I threaten Europe security or something or something like that. Yeah. Aaron Mate is a threat to European yeah. security. Yeah. He referred to Aaron Mate, pro- the propaganda of Aaron Mate. Yes. Yes. These are the minds that, you know, shape policy. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty, I mean, yeah, of course, who wants to go like be some mid-level bureaucrat in NATO. Fair enough. Like, yeah. like it's not like they're you know, drawing from the best and brightest. Except in you know, I, I even asked the guy like what he did. He said it was a lot of just uh, it was a lot of making coffee and reading documents and coming up with the ways in which explain <laughs> our mission to the world. And I was like, yeah, that sounds terrible. Yeah, that sounds terrible. And, and no wonder you're so bitter. Yeah, well, he can he he can uh, put his talents to good use as part of uh, I don't know the 77th Brigade or belling cat when he retires i don't know where you go from there but uh where do we go next here i was just some I classical should... music yeah listen to some classical music i i think we should listen to some mozart <laughs> i or if i'll get accused of anti-semitism if i say wagner <laughs> although i really like i enjoy ro- the a lot of wagner i enjoy tannhauser the people's chorus really romantic and slightly disturbing. There's a great Kirby. Um, there's a great episode of Kirby Enthusi- yeah. uh, enthusiasm about that. Um, but yeah, no, well, Mozart is um, a very appropriate for this, for this moment because Max, some news broke this yeah, week. Here it is. Your ongoing feud with the uh, founder of the Mozart mercenary group in Ukraine, which, in, which has just announced that it's shutting down. Uh, and I think, <laughs> I think you were played a here it is. in that, in that decision. Okay, so the Mozart group is one of the most <laughs> prolific, certainly well-publicized U.S. mercenary groups operating in Ukraine. And Colonel Andy Milburn, former Marine, has trained forces in Somalia, Israel, I think across the Middle East and in Ukraine. He sort of found his mojo, supposedly was a true believer in the Ukrainian cause. But some months later, he was forced to announce at probably the most lucrative period for mercenary activity in human history. Today was the last day for the Mozart group. The Mozart group ended today. The name and entity had become the subject of litigation and a distraction from our core mission, which was training Ukrainian soldiers, rescuing civilians, but the mission and people continue. So now let's talk about the distractions. We have a piece up at the gray zone that lays this out by Alex Rubenstein. And the distraction was Andy Milburn and his drunken behavior. So Alex's piece is called the crazy American because that's what Ukrainian officers, that's how they referred to Andy Milburn because of his drunken rampages across Kiev, which were publicized through litigation by the co-founder of the Mozart group. They were basically ashamed of him. They filed legal action to get him to, to quit. And so here's a excerpt from the, lawsuit against Andy Milburn, which contributed to bringing down the Mozart group. On multiple occasions, and I'm paraphrasing, Milburn was intoxicated and out after the curfew imposed by the Ukrainian government. And he appeared in a recorded video significantly intoxicated and making unfounded accusations and derogatory comments against the government of Ukraine and the Ukrainian military, the very people, Mozart Group, LLC, is in the country to assist. That would be the video that I publicized that would have never seen the light of day if I hadn't done so. And I think, you know, we showed it last week, but it's pretty entertaining. So we'll show it again. And this, yeah, I mean, this was the final blow for Andy Milburn. As soon as I can pull it up, 
he's basically being interviewed by these this show called Team House, who are military groupies. It's kind of a show for veterans. And he's getting sauced. It's a corrupt, fucked up society. Mm-hmm. That let you know. So I'm not. I'm not a big f- fan of uh, Ukraine. Oh, what is that? Oh, this is uh, mm-hmm. Buffalo Trace. Oh, um, okay. And the, and the Ukrainians are in violation of um, the Hague Convention. They, they, there is a. I forget the exact phraseology, but it is we we looked at this closely, and it's uh, yeah, they they should be no filming of uh, the, the phrase the the terminology is bringing attention blah 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 to media, um, and yes, the Ukrainians are violating that, you know, and and he goes on and on. He says they're led by sick individuals they're a corrupt society they commit war crimes on camera he's pleaded with them to stop but he doesn't really seem to be that forceful with them and you know he's making money doing all of this so why would he actually step in but it you can see he's slurring his words he's intoxicated as alex wrote his drunken mind spoke for his sober heart <laughs> and uh, he is now featured again in the New York Times, a publication that in October portrayed Andy Milburn as this heroic humanitarian figure rushing to the front lines to save Ukrainian civilians who had a Ukrainian flag emblazoned on his bag because he so believed in the cause. And now you have a, a de facto obituary for his career. And I loved how Jeffrey Gettleman, the New York Times reporter, refused to credit me. Yeah, he used a passive voice. Uh, the it circulated on 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 social yeah. media, uh, but hilariously, Andy Milburn, after accusing you of posting a deep fake, had to admit that yes, uh, your his comments were real, and he apologized for them. He said, "What did he say?" He said, "I shouldn't have said that." Yeah, well, first, I mean, here's his. This is on his personal account. We went through the tweets on his uh, account as Mozart group account, which were even more bonkers in Ukrainian. But here he says, Max Blumenthal, a journalist well known to be a conduit for Russian propaganda. Google him because, you know, Google is all legit. Released a deep fake interview in which I appeared to be confiding in him drunkenly about my feelings about war in Ukraine. So was he so drunk that he didn't even remember who he was talking to? Cause I've never had a conversation with Andy Milburn. Uh, I'm, so he's saying that he can, conf- that I published a deep fake. Like I used AI technology to completely manipulate his appearance, to make him say things he didn't actually say to me in an interview I never conducted. And then in the New York times in recent days, Milburn confessed that he shouldn't have said those things. So it wasn't really a deep fake. Aaron, as you said, it was a deep trace, deep Buffalo trace, deep Lafroy. <laughs> Uh, would you drink? Would you drink with Andy Milburn? I wouldn't. I. You know, there, there's like there's like good drunks and bad drunks. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's tempting. I mean, it'd be pretty enjoyable. I'd love to hear more of what he has to say when he gets drunk. You know, I'm That's sure. True. I'm sure there's more skeletons in his closet that you know a little alcohol might uh, might help get out. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you would hear some detailed stories about atrocities. I mean, who knows what? But uh, yeah, I think what we saw in that video where he knows he's on camera was just the tip of the iceberg of corruption and criminality by the Ukrainian forces he trained. And yeah, the New York Times said that another problem with the Mozart group was the the mercenaries he was bringing to Ukraine. Mm. These are Americans. Grizzled combat vets, in the words words of the New York Times, who admitted to struggling with PTSD and heavy drinking. When they weren't working, they gravitated to Kiev's strip clubs, bars, and online dating. So they basically were sex tourists uh, exploiting a population that has already been ruthlessly exploited by the rest of Europe and which has been impoverished through war. So really like great humanitarians here. And uh, good riddance, you know, you, 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 
before he announced the closure of the Mozart group, he re relentlessly smeared me. And so this is the gray zone curse. <laughs> You're done. You're done. I would, I would play a uh, twinkle, twinkle little star, which was inspired by Mozart right now, if I could on a tiny violin, but I just don't have one. <laughs> All right. So what do we, what do we got next? Well, we can turn to Capitol Hill where yeah. Ilhan Omar has just been booted from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. That was a vote taken by Republicans, uh, and she was kicked out along with Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell, who were taken off of the House Intelligence Committee. Now, I think in the case of Schiff and Swalwell, that the Republicans have a pretty strong case because both these people abuse their positions on the House Intelligence Committee to falsely claim that they had secret proof that Trump was a Russian agent, uh, Adam Schiff especially. Ilhan Omar, it's clear this is a political decision, and they're upset at her for her criticism of Israel, and they've made that very, very clear. The let's, problem uh, is... yeah. Let, let, let's can, just, let's yeah. just play some video by Kevin McCarthy sure, yeah. before we get your take. Yeah. She said the American military was equal to Hamas and the Taliban from a member of the foreign affairs. She said Americans only like Israel because it's all about the Benjamins. And three years later, she said, I didn't know there's a trope when it comes to referring to someone who's Jewish with money. She said on 9-11, on 9-11, as a member of Congress, as an individual who's sitting on foreign affairs, something happened that day. What does that say to other people around the world? What does that say to somebody else who wants to create another 9-11 America? I'm sorry. It's not right. We were right in our action, and she can serve on other committees. But it puts America in jeopardy, and I'm not going to do that under my watch. And it's fair in the process, unlike them. Something happened. What, what is he saying? Nothing happened on 9-11? Is he a 9-11 denier? <laughs> and, and, I mean, it's all about the Benjamins. That was... You know, it's just one of the, the, that was one of those instances where you just say something that's so obviously true and therefore forbidden in Washington. If it wasn't all about the Benjamins, this wouldn't have happened because the Benjamins are fueling Kevin McCarthy and so many other people who sit on that committee, their, their careers. Um, Aaron. Yeah. I mean, what she said was right. Uh, it was hundred percent true. I mean, APAC brags about how much influence it has and how much money it raises to exert that influence. So, her saying it's all about the Benjamins baby was correct. Uh, I think the critique we have is that Ilhan Omar um, is not like some sort of anti-imperialist martyr on so many policies. She's in line with the Republicans like Kevin McCarthy, for example, in funding every single time for the funding bills uh, on the proxy war in Ukraine. And, and also, and, if, and you pointed this out, Max, that the way Democrats are responding Instead of defending Ilhan Omar's critiques of Israel, they're trying to make this about identity politics and saying yeah. that they're they're making they're targeting her because she's a woman of color. And I'm sure for some Republicans, you, you could make that case that they're you know they're driven by racial animus and uh, animus towards her as a Muslim woman who wears the hijab. But this comes from her criticism of Israel. That's what the comment that got her in trouble was about. And Democrats in defending her for being ousted are not trying to defend her for a comment about that. I'm not trying to point out that that's why she's being targeted. Yeah. <laughs> and they're playing perfectly into the hands of the Republicans by taking this line that this is just about a woman of color being targeted, but let's listen to AOC's theatrical one minute performance. Woman from New York, representative Ocasio-Cortez. All right. Gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Now, <laughs> As also, as a fellow New Yorker, I think one of the things that we should talk about here is also one of the disgusting legacies after 9-11 has been the targeting and racism against Muslim Americans throughout the United States of America. And this is an extension of that legacy. Consistency, there is nothing consistent with the Republican Party's continued attack except for the racism and incitement of violence against women of color in this body. I had a member of the Republican caucus threaten my life and you all and the Republican Republican caucus rewarded him with one of the most 
prestigious committee assignments in this Congress. Don't tell me this is about consistency. Don't tell me that this is about an a, a condemnation of anti-Semitic remarks when you have a member of the Republican caucus who, have, who has talked about Jewish space lasers and an, an entire amount of tropes <laughs> and also elevated her to some of the highest committee assignments in this body. This is about targeting women of color in the, in the United States of America. Don't tell me because I didn't get a single apology. Time has expired. My life was threatened. Thank you. Oh, she threw the she threw the book at him. <laughs> She's talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. She made some weird comments about the Rothschilds and some kind of satellite system uh, on Facebook. And so it was interpreted as Jewish space lasers, but she never said Jewish space lasers. Hmm. Uh, and she's, you know, gotten some committee assignments, a Democrat stripped her from her committee assignments. So this is kind of like revenge for that. But the point that I made on Twitter was this is not necessarily about targeting a woman of color. The Republicans ran a woman of color a Muslim Somali military veteran against Ilhan Omar. She lost in her congressional election, who is uh, a hijabi. Mm. So the Republicans like women of color if they do what they want. They like men of color, like Clarence Thomas, if they do what they want. Most people of color don't generally do what the Republicans want. But this isn't about that. This is about the Benjamins. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about the Israel lobby and its power in American life. And they don't want to talk about that. AOC doesn't even want to deal with it. That's why she voted present on funding the Iron Dome, which is That's the right. key to Israel's ability to escalate endlessly against the defenseless people of the Gaza Strip. So she doesn't mention that at all. She makes it about identity politics. And then at the end, she makes it about herself in this performance where she can't even pull off her own lines. And the, every member of the squad said that. They all said, women of color. And this is what it, it's just, it's about racism. And, uh, I, I mean, I guess that's that's the line they want to take because, hey, what would happen to them if they brought up the Benjamins? The same yep. thing that happened to the white man in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, who right. was destroyed for basically defending the basic humanity of Palestinians. I don't even think he said anything as inflammatory as it's all about the Benjamins. He's no, white. He, He's yeah, a man. Yeah. He was destroyed. The Israeli government participated in that attack. So did the Labour Party. So That's did Keir Starmer. They're still attacking him. That's a great point. So did Mike Pompeo, who vowed to basically undermine him if ever if ever he got elected, or even to prevent him from from winning the election. Um, that's a great point. Uh, you can't say that Jeremy Corbyn was targeted for identity politics. Uh, he was targeted because he recognizes the identities of Palestinians and he stands up for their rights. And it, Democrats don't want to talk about that because they don't want to do that. And yeah. and they that's why when Ilhan Omar had that tweet, instead of defending her, they all apologize and said oh she didn't know about the sensitivity of the topic and she you know she didn't know she should have stood by what she tweeted because it was accurate and <clears throat> yes i mean what's the point of being in congress unless you want to be famous or rich uh <laughs> which are two things most people in the country want to be i'd assume the squad they at least like the notoriety and fame aoc probably wants to be senator maybe she thinks she can run for president someday um yeah, well, uh, a new point, as we just saw, is uh, to vote against socialism. Uh, you see that vote that just happened where there was a resolution to denounce yeah. socialism? Yeah. Ro Khanna was among the people to sign on. The resolution listed the crimes of uh, Chavez and Maduro, Venezuela, and Castro. And Ro Khanna voted for that, and so did Marcy Captor, Capper, I think her name is. Captor, yeah. Well, Captor, she's, yeah. Uh, she's got a, yeah. She's got a ton of Ukrainians in her district, I think. But yeah, they're all, I mean, they're all, the left is in the U.S. is anti-communist. So it basically repeated a lot of talking points that I see in the nation. Um, you know, that I hear from like Trotskyists all the time, like Bill Fletcher and, uh, you know, the ISO types. <laughs> it's not really like, it, but it's, it's being introduced by some straight up Neanderthals who are like, the communism has killed 200 million billion people. And they count like everyone who died in Nazi Germany fighting World War II. They, I mean, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation literally counts all the Nazi soldier deaths in World War II as victims of communism. I assume Be Stepan Bandera is a victim of communism. And that memorial is ushered in by a Democratic president, Bill Clinton. So the Republicans do this to like kind of get the Democrats 
to vote, to, to hope they'll vote against it so they can say, see, you're a communist. Uh, it, it's really stupid. But there's another point I wanted to make about Ilhan Omar that I think is more substantial and relevant to her, her constituents here. And it relates to, it's important to make because I don't have the tweet right in front of me, but when she was uh, stripped of her committee assignments, she said, this is not just about, you know, attacking a woman of color. It's about silencing the voices of pe of the people of Africa. So she, this is like her mm -hmm. version of Fauci saying, I am the science. She's saying, I am mama Africa. And she is not necessarily very well liked in her district by Somali Americans. She is hated by Ethiopians, Ethiopian Americans, Eritreans, because she has been a force for advancing U.S. imperialism on the Horn of Africa. And if the Democrats had somehow won in Congress, she would have been vice chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And that would have been the nightmare for many people from Africa who she claims to represent. Let's, let's get into why. This is an article at the Gray Zone we published by Ann Garrison, who's our friend who contributes to the Black Agenda Report and also hosts a show at Pacifica. Um, and it's about how Ilhan Omar was actually booed at a concert, a Somali-American concert in, uh, on, um, in Minneapolis Somali community on Somali Independence Day. So basically, Minneapolis is a bastion of the Somali American community. That's her district, the fifth congressional district in 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 Minneapolis, in Minnesota. It's a completely blue district, and yet she, this is how she was treated when she appeared at the concert. Everyone in the audience is Somali. All right, she's trying to. The, the more she tries to tell them to stop booing the more they boo so why are they booing her well there are a number of reasons one is that she's not present in her district very often and that community is more conservative than she is on social issues she's gotten uh close to the squad and advanced a lot of their positions on trans issues for example that aren't popular there but there are also a group of activists that appeared at bought tickets to the concert went to the front row and made plans to boo her because of her performance on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and, you know, let's start with her relationship with uh, Paul Kagame, the authoritarian dictator of Rwanda, which is backed by the U.S. and Israel. And Ilhan Omar actually voted against a House resolution to call on Kagame to release Paul Rusabagina, who is that? That's the guy that hotel who, who is the subject of Hotel Rwanda, right? He is a, a famous dissident figure in Rwanda. She voted against it, and here's her hanging out with uh, with Paul Kagame, Ilhan Omar. Well, she's she, she's hanging out with his wife, and she made a trip to Rwanda. Rwanda has been a major force, by the way, in advancing U.S interventionism in Ethiopia to remove the Ethiopian government. They've been supportive of the TPLF and arming that force. Now, here's Ilhan Omar with Dr. Tedros. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who is the head of the World Health Organization. He's the Secretary General, which is a group that exists under the auspices of the United Nations. And this is significant because Tedros also is the leading figure of the TPLF, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, which has been fighting an offensive war to take over Ethiopia and was for many years a U.S. proxy that was used to advance U.S. imperialism in Somalia. So that's really important to understand. She's meeting with him. Do you really think they're talking about uh, you know, COVID and healthcare? No, she, he's talking to her because he's lobbying for the TPLF because she sat at the time in an important position on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And you can look at Tedros's Twitter account. It's just nonstop lobbying for regime change in Ethiopia, which is a total violation of his remit at the World Health Organization. This is a UN official lobbying for a regime change war. Disgusting. Now, um, on many occasions, Ilhan has asked the State Department for legal determinations as to whether the Ethiopian government is guilty of atrocities. In other words, these are illegal determinations 
because she is assuming that the U.S. has the right to rule that international crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity, have been committed and action must be taken, as we saw in Libya and Syria. The same sort of determinations were sought to create the basis for U.S. intervention. That's what she was doing in Ethiopia. Only the U.N. Security Council can do that. The U.S. can't do that. You can see she questions she questioned the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs for a legal determination. And then she called for a carrot and stick approach against Ethiopia. She calls for sanctions. She's calling for the bullying of Ethiopia and Eritrea through a House resolution. And this is a key reason why she is despised by Ethiopians and Eritreans. But here's a more lesser known action that Ilhan Omar is engaged in in relation to her home country of Somalia, her family's home country. She quote tweeted in December 2021, a State Department threat to take action against Somalia if it did not hold early elections to remove its president, Farma Joe. Okay. She said, Farma Joe, as the year passes mandate, it's time for him to step aside. Now, why is that significant? He was interim president and the two states in Somalia refused to recognize his authority. He was very well liked by the Somali population and the Somali American community because of his anti-corruption efforts and because he was resisting U.S. efforts to place troops in Somalia. He was fighting to establish a direct one-person electoral process so they could have legitimate elections and break the instability that was caused by these parliamentary elections. And at the same time, he was also uh, fighting for a secular Somali state against the Al-Shabaab militants. So he eventually had to capitulate under this pressure from the U.S. and from Ilhan Omar to May 15th elections. He lost. A new president came into power. And guess what happened next? Biden sent troops to Somalia because the new president was a, an imperial tool, was less resistant than Pharma Joe. So here's the kicker. This is really something that shocked me to learn as soon as I can get it up on screen, is that after the new president came into power in Somalia, Ahmed, a, a political operator named Ahmed Hersey, took to Facebook to welcome the new president, Somalia, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, and to announce that he was going to be working with him to implement his political agenda. Here he is, Ahmed Hersey with President Mahmoud. Who is Ahmed Hersey? This is the first husband of Ilhan Omar, who divorced her after walking in on her and her um, aide in pajamas together uh, as they were having an affair. That's her new husband. So basically, Ilhan Omar played a role in bringing this president to the right in power, and then someone who is very close to her goes to work for him. And this is why so many Africans have lashed out, especially people from the Horn of Africa against Ilhan Omar, since she claimed to be the voice of Africa, and they are not sympathetic to her, even though she's being attacked by Kevin McCarthy for some very, very twisted, malign reasons. Uh, so it's a complicated scenario, and it really should help illuminate how anti-imperialists view the House Foreign Affairs Committee and view these kinds of episodes that are so fraught with identity politics and have much more complex issues behind them. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I don't think she should have been kicked off the committee, obviously, because the reasons were punishment for her political views and whether her political views are right or wrong you shouldn't kick someone off a committee for their views in this case her views i think were correct but that doesn't mean that she is a martyr for standing up to neocons and and, and one correction sorry that was her second husband ahmed hersey second husband of okay i, I get confused but go ahead aaron okay. yeah no it, it it doesn't mean that now i think ultimately this this is good for ilhan omar because she'll be able to uh, shield herself from criticism on the left by saying, well, look at these Republicans going after me for my pro-Palestinian views. And 
for some people that will be enough to ignore all of her other really uh, questionable views on so many other topics where she's actually in lockstep with the Republicans who just kicked her out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was kicked off for her opinions. It was McCarthyite by McCarthy. We, we agree on that, but I wanted to bring those issues to light. Um, well, it's not discussed anywhere else. I mean, you don't, I mean, uh, Ilhan has a reputation on the left as being, you know, principled and, uh, an ally. And you've just, you know, when it comes to Africa, which, um, doesn't get covered very much in, in lefty media in the U S uh, you know, you've just explained very clearly why many people in Africa don't feel the same way. Do we have any allies in Congress? Do we personally have any allies in Congress? <laughs> if we did, well, I, I don't think we should. We would want to name them, but not to my knowledge. No, they wouldn't want us to name them. Yeah, I no. had some no. former member of her staff actually reach out to me, like before, you know, early on, and say, you know, we love what you do, but we just can't acknowledge that you exist. Sorry. Every staffer that I've come across who works for a squad does not like us. Uh, I, you know, maybe I'm missing something, but um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of. Uh, you know, the, the the people who call us the usual names, I think, also include some some staffers who work for the squad. I mean, look, I just think of all those who, with any principle, have been chased out of town. So Dennis Kucinich, who I interviewed recently, he was forced out because he actually had principle. He was consistent across, yeah, issues. Like so, whether it was Bush bombing Iraq or Obama bombing Libya, he opposed it. Uh, he wasn't a partisan hack, and you can't say the same. For the squad, just look at how they're lining up behind Biden on the Ukraine proxy war, the most dangerous issue in the world. And they're in total lockstep with not just Biden, but also Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. And at one point you're making, well, this is Ann Garrison's in the chat, and she made a really good point. Um, that Schiff being persecuted by McCarthy actually enhances his chance of winning Feinstein's Senate seat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Ilhan, well, she'll be able to raise money for whatever she wants to yeah. do off this. And just as Marjorie Taylor Greene was able to kind of become a MAGA star off of uh, being persecuted by the, the Democrats who wouldn't, wouldn't even allow, they wouldn't even allow debate about committee assignments. Like at least the Republicans are allowing the, these, uh, performances by the squad to take place i really enjoyed it that's true what's funny about Chip, by the way is he was he was accusing republicans of fundraising off of kicking him off the house intel committee while he himself was fundraising off of being kicked off the house intel committee and when he talks about why he thinks republicans are doing it he'll always say it's because i stood up to president trump and i was a threat to trump and i led the first impeachment well just taking that at face value when schiff led that first impeachment against trump for freezing weapons to ukraine Trump ended that impeachment with the highest approval ratings of his presidency. So that shifts track record in taking on Trump. And of course, the real reason was because he lied to the public and pretended that he had seen secret ev evidence of a Trump-Russia conspiracy uh, and did so because he was on the House Intelligence Committee. So he could say, I've seen the evidence. I just can't tell you what it is because it's it's classified. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it was anti-Semitic that they picked him <laughs> off uh, there. This is an attack on Jewish men. <laughs> Swalwell. Oh man. Well, let's 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 kind of on that note, Aaron. There's been a really significant intervention in the long-standing Russia Gate debate. It really wasn't a debate. We always knew it was a hoax, but now you're getting so much uh, mainstream validation. How does it feel to be validated? by mainstream <laughs> outlets like the Columbia Journalism Review. Jeff Girth, veteran Beltway journalist, has published a 24,000-word piece on Trump-Russia, the press versus the president, part one. And it's this is in the Columbia Journalism Review. So it's, it, it, all, it, is, it absolutely has to be taken seriously, unlike the gray zone, because we're conspiracy theorists. Um, and it's causing conniption fits, just yeah. complete outrage among some of the key voices of Russiagate, Aaron. So what's in this piece? How do you feel about it? Do you feel validated? And I don't need to be validated, Ma Max. I, I don't need to be validated for challenging the dumbest conspiracy theory of all time, that uh, President Putin had brainwashed Trump, blackmailed him, and used Compromat to get him to do his bidding, all while you know duping millions of Americans into voting for Trump. 
via sophisticated social media memes and email hacks. I mean, uh, and of course, uh, while also fueling this cu culture where it was good to encourage war with Russia. So helping to give us the Ukraine crisis that we're in right now. So I don't need to be validated for challenging that because the evidence wasn't there and it was so ridiculous and dangerous. But what Jeff Gerth has just done, and Jeff Gerth is a uh, nearly 30-year veteran of the New York Times, highly decorated, won the Pulitzer, all kinds of awards. He just published this 20,000-plus word article, four parts, looking at the media's uh, coverage of Russiagate and just how they got it so wrong. And he goes through story after story where the media pushed fake Trump-Russia innuendo that was fed to them by Democratic Party op operatives and intelligence officials. And even when countervailing evidence came out, either at the time or later, they just wouldn't report it. And Jeff Gerth goes through example after example after example, and it's devastating. And he does it in a very dispassionate, sober way, except for at the end when he writes a note where he says, he explains the kind of reason why he wrote this article, which is that he's a veteran of the media. He respects the craft of journalism. And he was very worried about what was being done to journalism via Russiagate, where it just, it was turning the media into a complete uh, joke. I mean, I, I mean, not to say that it was just Russiagate that did that, but just the level of hackery and fraud to him was very worrying. And that's why, since the, no one else was doing any reflection, there was no kind of mea culpa like there was after the Iraq WMD scam. He felt that he needed to do this. And the result is, I think, a real contribution to seeing how Americans were subjected to exactly what they were told Russia was doing to them, which is a massive disinformation campaign. And right. this article is predictably angering the people who propagated that that disinformation campaign. Uh, but of course, they have no substantive response to it because it's all true. They were they were t they took part in a massive fraud. And finally, one of their own is calling them out. Yeah. So let's and, and, and as we've been pointing out week after week, this wasn't just about Trump Russia. This is about greasing the skids for the Ukraine proxy war. This yeah. is a war narrative using bogus propaganda to turn the U.S. public into a braying mob demanding not just that Trump be impeached, but that Putin be bombed and Russia be regime changed. So here's someone who knows something about regime change, David Frum, soft-handed neocon chicken hawk who's been welcomed as part of the resistance in Washington, which includes no shortage, run by liberal Democrats, but he was the former speechwriter to a right-wing Republican, George W. Bush, stating that Russia helped Trump win the 2016 presidential election. Trump welcomed Russian help. Trump's intimates sought even more help. His intimates? <laughs> Trump's campaign manager shared information. He shared information. All repeatedly lied about it. In office, Trump supported Russian policy goals. Yeah. Like not giving offensive weaponry to Ukraine as Obama also did. Saved you 24,000 words. So he's like, don't read the piece. Don't look in there. Trust me, because Iraq has WMDs and, and is part of uh, the axis of evil. I well, Trust me, I'm a neocon. That second last line where Frum says that in office, Trump supported Russian policy goals, that captures how dangerous Russiagate was. Yep. Because at the same time as people like David Frum were insisting that there was a massive conspiracy between Trump and Russia and that Trump was doing Putin's bidding, Trump was actually enacting policies that massively escalated tensions with Russia because the media and partisan hacks like David Frum were so wedded to their narrative that Trump was a Putin put, a puppet that incentivized them to look away from what Trump was actually doing. So there wasn't any attention paid to things like Trump tearing up vital nuclear arms control treaties like the INF Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, almost killed the New START Treaty, um, which massively escalated tensions with Russia and played actually a major role, I think, in giving us the Ukraine war. And also, Trump, when he came into office, he was accused of being a Russian puppet. So he was incentivized to try to prove uh, his his uh, accusers wrong. So what did he do? He approved weapons to go to Ukraine that Obama wouldn't send. And when he briefly froze those weapons, he was impeached by Adam Schiff, who yeah. said we have to uh, aid Ukraine so that we can fight Russia over there. We don't have to fight them here. And what Russiagate did was enlisted millions of liberals. And you can say a lot of progressives, too. For example, all the progressives in Congress, including Bernie Sanders, in the agenda of neocons like David Frum. And it also undermined their ability, if they ever wanted to, to try to stand up to actual the actual militarism 
that Trump was pursuing toward Russia. And um, uh, so right there, he's capturing how dangerous his conspiracy theory was. It wasn't just dumb. It wasn't just embarrassing. It was dangerous. And it played a major role in giving us now this war in Ukraine because it completely criminalized diplomacy with Russia, as the late Stephen F. Cohen constantly warned about um, over, over deaf ears. And you know, by the way, that's the topic of my forthcoming book, which will be out uh, this year, uh, How Russiagate Helped Give Us the Ukraine War. And uh, no surprise at all, the same people who fell for Russiagate and push Russiagate are also diehard supporters of the proxy war now. Yep. And how few of them have ever picked up a gun and seen the face of battle. I mean, they're all chicken hawks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's and, and here, here's here's one of our most esteemed regime propagandists. Another David, David Korn. CJR and Jeff Girth devoted 24,000 words. Apparently the length of it means that it's bad <laughs> when, you know, if you could conjure up that many words, it yeah. kind of means that you're taking on a gigantic hoax. That's just Absolutely. so massive. I mean, it could have been, your book is going to be more than 24,000 oh, yeah. words. Oh yeah. They devoted 24,000 <laughs> words to a piece. I could kind of do a David Korn voice to a piece criticizing media coverage of the Trump Russia scandal and totally missed the point of the scandal. <laughs> Worse, they bolster Trump's bogus self-serving narrative. Please read an RT, my critique of is it theirs. Is RT, oh, is that Russia today? Is this like... <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is uh, this is self-serving from David Korn because uh, it, when he says that Girth missed the point of the scandal, what he means is uh, that, you know, Girth is focusing on the fact that the media said there was a conspiracy between Trump and Russia and there was no conspiracy and they simply just buried all the countervailing evidence. And yeah. David Corn is saying, you're missing the point. He said, the point is <laughs> that Russia attacked our election and that Trump welcomed it. Well, that wasn't the point when Russiagate was happening. People like David Corn were saying that there, was a, that there was collusion between Trump and Russia and that Robert Mueller was going to prove it. David Corn even co-authored a book called Russian Roulette that is based around the fabrications of Christopher Steele, the top conspiracy theorist really in Russiagate, because his dossier of conspiracy theories was so influential. So now, in a self-serving way, David Korn is changing the narratives to something that Trump, that Russia attacked our election and Trump didn't stop it. And Trump welcomed it. Um, and of course, the idea that Trump attacked, uh, that Russia attacked our election and waged this massive interference campaign, that's also undermined by all the available evidence. And Girth doesn't go into that, but I have, for anyone who's read anything I've written, all the evidence there is that this is part of the Russia Gate scam, since a lot of it comes from the same people, Democratic operatives and intelligence officials. But this is a really important reckoning, and no wonder it's angering people like David Korn. And next week on Pushback, I'll be interviewing Jeff Girth to talk to him about, nice. about this piece. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Here's a portion of David Frum's piece that I wanted to highlight. It's hilarious. Korn. Korn. He says, he referring to Jeff Girth, he defines the Trump-Russia affair by only two elements of the tale the question of trump russia collusion with moscow which is kind of a big element of the tale <laughs> and the unconfirmed steel <laughs> oh, this is exactly how trump and his wait this is exactly how trump and his lieutenants want the scandal to be perceived that's david corn corn not from but they're the same now um even though Corn once wrote a book about how Fromm was a huge liar and the Bush administration lied us into Iraq. They all want, they both want to lie us into war with Russia, but this is the amazing part. David from David Corn, sorry, wrote a whole book about how the, about how the steel dossier was the mother load <laughs> that exposed Trump, Russia. He was one of the first journalists. That's or, right. If not, he was the journalist he was. to leak the steel dossier. He was. He he had he was the first gathered article. by Christopher Steele along with Jane Mayer and all these other Washington liberal bigwigs at the Tabard Inn. Yep. And Christopher Steele handed out copies of the dossier, and they thought that they were getting what would be the ingredient, the secret sauce for the <laughs> impeachment of Trump. So I don't now realize. he's saying it's unconfirmed, and and how dare you talk about what I've been talking about for years that I based like a big part part of my career on. I didn't realize that meeting between Christopher Steele and these U.S. journalists like David Corn was at the Tabard Inn. What a, what a desecration of a holy place! Like the yeah, Tabard well, Inn. anyone can go in there. I mean, I think they should have a no neocons policy. I'm um, for that that segregation. Yeah. I don't think neocons should be allowed anywhere except for like a padded room, but in like you know, uh, yeah. uh, they should just be renditioned to somewhere. 
but but look, this is a really good point. The first article promoting Christopher Steele was written by David Korn, who called him yeah. a uh, a professional, highly respected uh, foreign intelligence officer who was deemed to be credible, and that was by David Korn. So David Korn promoted Christopher Steele, gave a copy of his dossier to the FBI just to make sure they had it because he really wanted them to have it, and then. Uh, spent years and years claiming that there was a massive conspiracy between Trump and Russia. And then when that didn't work out, he changed his narrative and he accuses someone like Jeff Gerth of missing the point, which he himself was doggedly promoting until it collapsed. He thought he was going to get another award. What did he get? A Pulitzer for reporting that Romney said uh, there's like, what did he say? Makers and takers or like there's a 52% who are all right, 46. Yeah, 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 yeah. 46. It wasn't even like it was just uh he helped the the Democrats beat Mitt Romney, who's now who's was always part of the regime. Like it wouldn't have been that yeah. big of a deal. But uh David Korn didn't do anything. It was just some guy in the catering crew had filmed those comments of Mitt Romney and he just gave them to David Korn. It wasn't yeah. like some great investigative feat or that he cultivated jittery sources found whistleblowers and then he thought that was going to happen again because he got some dodgy dossier handed to him (laughs) in a washington hotel and now he's pretending like it never happened like at least his co-author of their book russian roulette michael isikoff has partially acknowledged fault for pushing the steel dossier i don't think david corn has ever done that no of course not no no he he just as you see as you showed there he just calls it unconfirmed which is so funny (laughs) Uh, and yeah, uh, Michael Isikoff is the only mainstream adjacent reporter I can think of who pushed the collusion in innuendo, who's basically apologized for it. He's backed off of that. He still pushes this line that Russia attacked our election. And uh, he dismissed I, when I interviewed him, uh, he dismissed the fact that CrowdStrike, which is the Clinton contractor that generated the Russian hacking allegations. He dismissed the fact that they had privately admitted there was no evidence that Russia hacked the DNC. He said, uh, who cares? But but, but he'll get there, I'm sure, uh, one day, just, just like he did on, on Collusion. And um, I'm certainly still on that case. But uh, And, of course, that's the part that still needs reckoning. That's the last pillar of Russiagate standing. Nobody yeah. tries to argue now that there was a conspiracy between Trump and Russia. The P-tape was real. But there still is this canard out there that Russia waged this massive, sophisticated interference campaign. And that one hasn't been... Um, completely completely destroyed yet i mean it has in our spaces but in the mainstream it hasn't but i i think as more information comes out it will well i just want to make one more point about this which is that this twenty four thousand word piece i'm glad you're interviewing jeff girth about it props to him for for doing it i remember uh being at the collision event in toronto which was the predecessor to web summit where we got to be among all these mainstream journalists and i went to some of the seminars and i heard the editor-in-chief of ProPublica, which is like a CJR-style legacy publication, complain in a sort of passing remark that we didn't get the Russia story right. <laughs> he basically said, we, we blew it, but you know, there's no accountability. And nobody actually at the time tried to do anything about it. Where was the 24,000 word takedown when it mattered? No one would do it because they would have been accused of basically being traitors, pro-Trump, Putin lovers. So the press is totally cowardly, even in attempting to set the record straight. And no one will be held accountable. I mean, we have fake story after fake story pushing the Hamilton 68 bot list. No one's been, none of those stories have been taken down. Mother Jones said they'd look into their fake stories. David Korn published a fake story about uh, new knowledge, like based on uh, new knowledge's Alabama Russian playbook campaign. He isn't taking that down. There's no one at, in at, on the Mother Jones board who's willing to look at this and say, maybe David Corn just lied and lied and lied and published a string of fake stories for years and we need to do something about this. And it just took them, it's taking them years. Like it kind of reminds me how of how like white people like black music only from 40 years ago or certain certain of them it like becomes like like safe to like like public enemy now but at the time it was kind of like really like oh man this is frightening yeah. uh you know, i don't want to oh, fight the power uh, now yeah. now it's like yeah let's let's yeah. fight the power by uh 
at. Well, listen, uh, Max, you know, on that point about the Hamilton 68, I mean, that, that's an example of why the gray zone is important and is one of the few outlets that does its job. Because back in 2017, you were writing about a Hamilton 68, the supposed dashboard that tracks Russian bots. You pointed out it was a neocon scam. And what did the Twitter files just confirm? Matt Taibbi put it out recently uh, that Hamilton 68 was a neocon scam. And, and we know that because he got the list of the supposed Russian bots that Hamilton 68 was keeping track of. And it was ridiculous. There were real people yeah. on there like Joe Loria of Consortium News. And this is obvious at the time. You called it out. And, you know, this, this is the case where, you know, it takes a few years, but the proof, the concrete, like the hard evidence, the smoking gun does come out. Although it was obvious at the time, but... Um, that's just another validation of all the work that we've done in trying to challenge this scam. And of course, uh, the uh, the people who pushed it will never try, will never acknowledge us, or at least they'll never acknowledge us unless they're attacking uh, people who do give us credit and uh, and who do acknowledge us. And so, should, should I start like, should yeah, should should I start like quoting Public Enemy lyrics in an Ari Melber voice? Like we <laughs> we didn't believe the hype, we shut them down. <laughs> and we continue to fight the power. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, should we, uh, you know, should we get to uh, Ukraine? I think we've been in the Ukraine. We've been, we've been doing Ukraine. Um, yeah, we can do another segment if you want. Um, or we can call it. Uh, do you all want us to do another segment out there? <laughs> Send us send us uh, seven hundred dollar super chats if you want us to do another segment. No, I'm joking. We're not. We we do this for the love. Um, yeah. Let's um. Let, let let's let's discuss we, that a little bit because uh, it's a story we've been following constantly, and uh, it gets worse and worse each week. Um. We have, what is the total of military aid to Ukraine? I don't think this is accurate, but basically the U.S. and the Biden administration have announced plans to send an additional $2.2 billion in aid to Ukraine. This will include Javelin anti-tank missiles, artillery ammunition, and conventional and long-range rockets for HIMARS. And this comes as the Ukrainian military and Ukrainian leadership is demanding Atakums missiles, which can reach cities in the interior of Russia, as well as F-16 jets after receiving authorization of a shipment of Abrams tanks and German Le Leopard tanks under U.S. pressure. So this brings, according to Jack Detch, the um, total of U.S. military aid to Ukraine to $29.3 billion since Russia's full-scale invasion. I think the number is much higher. I've seen the number of aid in total, including humanitarian aid and you know the aid used to allow the Ukrainian parliament to increase their salaries, uh, putting it at close to $100 billion. Oh well, yeah, the and the amount approved authorized is definitely over hundred billion dollars. That's that's official, in terms of what's been dispersed. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure it's also more than that twenty nine billion there. But yeah, this is just another escalation, and it comes after the U.S. approved sending M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine, and there's talk now of sending F-16s, and there's also talk, and we can play some of these clips in the British yeah. media, of you know high ranking former officials who want to send troops. They actually want to fight Russia directly, which is a recognition, I think, that this war is not going as advertised. We've been told that Ukraine is routing Russia, expelling Russia from its territory. Doesn't seem to be the case because the way these people are talking, it's they sound pretty panicked. So are this, you suggesting boots on, on the ground? I think that that is something that we now have to consider, Kay. Yes, I, I do. I feel that certainly if you were to put a NATO force in there, uh, that would be NATO uh, versus Russia. Uh, but Russia is the is the guilty party here. Russia has invaded Former Defense Minister another of the UK. sovereign state, and uh, we have declared. Everybody in the West has declared that uh, Ukraine has got to win, and we're doing a tremendous amount. Britain led the way under Boris Johnson in leading the uh, uh, the support for Ukraine. But I do think we have to think very hard 
uh, where this is going. Because at the moment, what it's looking like is a stalemate uh, with uh, Russia just flattening whole parts of uh, that sovereign country, uh, like they did in Aleppo. Uh, they're a brutal regime. They lie through their teeth. And the West has got to decide um, that if it is going to support Ukraine, and Ukraine does have to win, because if Ukraine does not win, where will Putin go next? So that was the former defense minister of the UK basically saying, we need to consider boots on the ground. They're talking about it. They're, they're paving the path. And as we've clearly established through internal classified British Ministry of Defense documents and correspondences between advisors to the MOD in the UK through the reporting of Kit Clarenberg, they are attempting to push the US further than it wants to go and consider Biden to be kind of a molly coddler because he doesn't want to escalate to that degree. That's been the real role of the UK. Aaron, you're muted. What does a molly coddler mean? It's like an old old timey term i think it might have <laughs> some people in the chat are going to correct me i think it's a world war one era okay. term it's for people who uh who coddle foreign enemies got it uh or overprotective of designated enemies yeah i actually you know i i, I learned that term because it came back during the iraq war the second gulf war as part of the lexicon of Bush Republicans to attack people like David Korn, who I thought were against the Iraq war, but turned out to have just been against Bush's Republican war. Um, we got more. I mean, there's just, this is Tobias Elwood. And for those of you who don't know, Tobias Elwood is a member of Britain's 77th brigade, which is, a pro the propaganda wing of the British military. They run troll farms on Twitter. They are specifically engaged in trying to drum up support among the British public for a war with Russia. And here's one of the most hysterically anti-Russia figures in the UK who happens to be the head of the defense committee in the British parliament, which puts him in a pretty influential position. We are now at war in Europe. We need to move to a war footing. We are involved in that. We've mobilized our procurement processes. We're gifting equipment. We need to face Russia directly and reckon that rather than leaving Ukraine to do all the work. We are now at war in Europe. We need to move to a war footing. We are involved in that. We've Okay. So, I mean, he, you know, very similar to the remarks by German, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbach, who said we are at war with Russia. That's right. This is sort of a unilateral declaration without the German public participating in a vote on whether they, their country should go to war with Russia. Here you have another influential figure, this time in the UK, saying the same thing. Yeah. And uh, then we have David Petraeus, the former head of the CIA, who is still somehow talking about the prospect of regime change in Russia as if that is somehow uh, not only desirable, but attainable uh, at a time when Putin still has uh, huge support from the Russian population. Here's Petraeus speaking to David Ignatius of the Washington Post. The other alternative, of course, is regime change. Uh, and that is so hard to calculate. And it, it, he has such a grip on power. This is a not just an autocracy, as you know, it's a dictatorship. And within that, it's a klep democracy, dictatorship, um, and everyone around him uh, is in a position because the individual is intensely loyal and proven himself uh, to Putin. Uh, very, very hard in that kind of scenario. Lots of different security services, all of which, again, uh, Putin controls, to try to plan and carry out some kind of coup. Um, but also, as you know from history, um, what is inconceivable uh, all of a sudden can become inevitable, uh, sometimes overnight. Um, and looking for those kind of indicators is something that an organization near and dear to both our hearts uh, are looking for, I'm sure, very, very assiduous. So keep hope alive, everybody. Keep hope alive. Regime change. Well, sure, sure, sure. Putin has a lot of support. Uh, 
but keep hope alive. Maybe it can happen very quickly. Well, that then isn't that the point of the war? It is a regime change war. Absolutely. And that, that's the whole point of the project of Ukraine is the anti-Russia. That's oh, yeah. the whole point of the U.S. trainers in Ukraine. That's the point of the U.S. weapons. That was the point of the Maidan coup. It's of the sanctions. Is, of the, the sanctions, sanctions now aimed at destroying the Russian economy, which has not worked. GDP has shrunk a little bit, but the collapse of the ruble, like Biden said, we're going to turn the ruble into rubble. That just hasn't happened. To, to turn the ruble into rubble, the whole point would be to set the Russian population against the Kremlin and create some basis for a color revolution, mass discontent. I, I think that's highly unlikely, but this, as the Kremlin and Russian leadership openly acknowledges, this war is a existential war. This is a war to, this is a to be or not to be situation. There are plans to balkanize Russia, to break it up into five to weaken Russia, to bring it back to the 90s when it was kind of a Mad Max style capitalist free market dystopia. Uh, this war, if Russia loses and it is forced to pull back, if it cedes Crimea, this could lead towards a regime change style scenario. And that is the objective of people like David Petraeus. And I think that's that's what he has in mind. That's the point of what was once considered unthinkable to send the tanks, then to send the F-16s, then to send the attackums, then to send the boots on the ground, to send the troops. And what I'm worried about, because they are so hell-bent on regime change, because of what Putin represents in terms of a fulcrum point to a multipolar world order, and you know, reversing the unipolar trend, is some kind of incident that would be like Duma on a grand scale, Aaron, that would trigger trigger a NATO Article 5. Do you, do you share I, that? I think that's totally fair to speculate. Remember, there was talk of that early in the war. Remember, we were hearing uh, speculation and warnings at, uh, from the U.S. that Putin was going to use chemical weapons in, in Ukraine? Yeah. And there even was an incident where some people, I think, tied to the Azov Battalion, tried to claim that they were victims, victims of a chemical attack. So, of course, I think that's definitely in the playbook. And I'm sure there are people inside the national security state who are considering something like that. I think it's totally fair to speculate because we have a record of it as we saw in Syria. And by the way, after our stream ends, we're going to publish my newest article on the OPCW cover scandal where we're going to have a lot more on that. And we're exposing basically the OPCW's brand new deception on that. And uh, it's it's quite the story. Yeah, well, I, I just read it. We've been preparing it. It's, it's a devastating piece. And... It's, it's all we can do as journalists, uh, and we can't cover all of these deceptions and incidents. I, I'm, I mean, I'm sort of shocked that the fighting around the Zaporozhye nuclear plant in Ukraine didn't amount to something more catastrophic because yeah. you had Russian troops controlling the air, area around the Zaporozhye nuclear plant and Ukrainian forces attacking it, shelling a nuclear plant day after day after day. And then you'd see one headline after another in U.S. media, Zaporozhye plant shelled, but they never say who's doing it. And they make you think that Russia is attacking <laughs> yeah. a nuclear plant to cause mass death and another Chernobyl across Ukraine. A plant so that they control. They setting a, a, trip pl wire. a plant that they control. The, the idea yes. we're supposed to believe is that just as Russia supposedly blew up its own pipeline, the Nord Stream 2, we also were supposed to believe that Russia was shelling a nuclear plant that its own forces were controlling. Question here about a new uh, documentary about Mariupol. I haven't seen it, but I'll, I'll be checking it out. I know I that that documentary was featured on Democracy Now! Uh, last <laughs> week or something. So I, it's a safe bet that it's uh, proxy war propaganda. Um, I yeah. think that's a very safe bet. And, but we do have another clip, and this is of a, another former national security state official with a different take than what, we, what we've been hearing, who actually acknowledges, I think, the reality, who's saying that this war is not going as advertised. And it's Richard Kemp, who yeah, is, a, is a, a retired British Army commander. Yeah, this is Colonel Richard Kemp. He, um, I think he was in, in active in the destruction of Yugoslavia, maybe in the first Gulf War as well. And then he basically got a gig as a asset of the Israel lobby and was sent around the world to sing Israel's praises 
Uh, but here he is making unusually candid comments. The first thing I'd say is, is not to take too much notice of what most of the mainstream media has got to say about Ukraine, because most of them are really just regurgitating the Ukrainian general staffs. They're not taking account of, of other perspectives, such as what the Russians are saying they're doing. And very often that does lead to a distorted picture. But I think in reality, um, the Russians are doing their best now, as we speak, to uh, take the whole of the Donbass region in eastern Crimea, uh, eastern Ukraine. And they're being quite successful at that. I think they're hammering the hell, unfortunately, out of the Ukrainians with artillery and then going in to mop them up. It's a, sl a slow, long <clears throat> process. But I think eventually, unfortunately, they will probably prevail in eastern Ukraine. The first yeah, I mean, and that seems to be recognized as well by David Ignatius to some extent in a recent column at the Washington Post. If you don't know who David Ignatius is, he's basically the CIA and the State Department's favorite stenographer in Washington or one of them. He obviously was just speaking on behalf of Tony Blinken, who he'd interviewed, and they were talking about how there was going to have to be some settlement. I don't know if they were talking, they were thinking it would be along the lines of the Dnieper River, but they're taking Crimea off the table there. And here you have a recognition by a figure who is not uh, Chomsky and interventionist critic in mainstream British media that Russia will eventually take the Donbass region. Yeah, because it's obvious we've gotten so much propaganda and, but this whole, this could only go on for so long. And this was always going to be the case where Russia just has dominant military power. Uh, the U there are elements of the U S that don't want to fight Russia directly, especially in the Pentagon who know what that would entail. And so the U.S. plan is, has always been to prolong this for as long as possible without triggering direct confrontations. So basically use Ukraine to bleed Russia as much as they could. And now we're seeing the results. And it's impossible to hide that anymore. And I'm, I'm sure, I mean, if I'm a betting person, I think that they're going to try as long as they can to keep this going for as long as they can. Yeah. But there's a recognition that it has to end eventually. Because the only way uh, it ends with Russia losing is if there's nuclear war and then we all lose. So... Uh, hopefully there are people who will constrain the forces that are willing to risk that. Because there are some people inside the government that are willing to risk that outcome. Where I see it going, where I think a lot of smart people I listen to see it going, which could be wrong, is a Russian counteroffensive by the spring, Russia gaining ground and more desperation or more calls for boots on the ground, direct intervention. And I can't say where it would go from there, but I think that increases the likelihood of a Duma-like incident triggered to save what's left of the Ukrainian military as it falters. And, uh, you know, I hope I don't have to go back to this live stream and clip out what I just said when that takes place. But given the history that we've learned in Syria, Libya, and, you know, even before that, the whole history laid out in Bosnia, which we now understand better through Canadian peacekeeper cables that were reported on by Kit Clarenberg, and Tom Secker that you can read at the gray zone. These kind of false flag incidents have been central to driving Western intervention in these kinds of conflicts. And so that's something that we should all be incredibly concerned about as we hear those calls for direct intervention intensifying well i think that's a very uh somber but appropriate way to end this stream max uh yeah this has been uh this is great thanks everybody for joining us and uh giving us likes because apparently that helps and uh i'll be publishing very soon at thegrayzone.com my newest article on the OPCW Syria cover-up scandal, where I respond to a brand new report that's just been issued by the OPCW, basically doubling down on the cover-up and directly accusing Syria of a chemical attack in Douma. And what I show in this article, and we can talk more about this next week, is that the OPCW is relying on a brand new line of argument. It's relying on what it basically claims is newly discovered evidence, and it's relying on a line of argument that is undermined by its own findings, which somehow was overlooked by the people who put this new OBCW report together. And it's pretty devastating 
Hope people read it at thegrayzone.com and we can discuss it next week here on the stream. We're definitely going to discuss it and we're going to be here every Friday to the best of our ability. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for hitting the like button. Thanks for all your support and don't look up because there's a <laughs> Chinese balloon there. <clears throat> and if they shoot it down, it's going to come down somewhere in some cow field. <laughs> Peace. Peace, everybody.